Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Aaron Espinoza, and I am the Library and Observatory Director, and I would like to welcome you all. Uh, before we get started today, can I please ask that you silence your cell phones? I know you all think you have already done it. There's going to be one of you. Um, uh, so the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory, uh, how do we do all of our programming? Uh, our programming is actually sponsored by our Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory Foundation. Our foundation is the fundraising uh, arm of the Library and Observatory, and their goal is to raise all of the funds to 100% uh, for our collection development. So that's all of the books, all of the DVDs, all the electronic resources we have in our library, and all of our programming to make it free of charge to our patrons. So this is sponsored by the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory Foundation. I did not see any of our board here today, and that's okay. But again, I wanted to thank them uh, for all of their continued support to make these opportunities for our community. <laughs> if you have not already, please pick up your program guide. Uh, we have October and November still left for our program guide. We have a multitude of programs coming up over the next uh, two months. Uh, this week, we have, on October 7th, uh, the Rancho Mirage Writers Series presents uh, Edward J. Larson. He wrote a book on Franklin and Washington, The Founding Partnership. So he'll be here on Friday at 2 o'clock. Uh, next week, Monday the 10th, uh, we have a film called Inherent the, In uh, Inherent the Wind. On Tuesday, we have another writer series, and this time it is New York Times and USA Today uh, best-selling author Kate Quinn talking about her book, Diamond Eye. And then on Wednesday, we end our week with adult programming with Steinway artist and library favorite jazz pianist Lenore Raphael at 7 p.m. Um, can I get a show of hands? How many people have had trouble signing up for our library stargazing parties in the evening? All right, I see a few hands in there. Um, please pay attention to our e-blasts that are coming out. If you have not already subscribed to them, please do so. They're on our website. Uh, we are going to unveil a new type of programming opportunity, and it is called OPEN, and that is Observatory Public Exploration Nights. It will be more like our Swoon at the Moon program, where it will be more of a passive programming to get more people through the facility. There will be no more registration um, frustrations. Right now, we've been filling up our 250 spots within about three to five minutes, and then the frustration begins, not only for you, but for our staff. Um, so again, please pay attention to those. Uh, we're, we really do want to get all the community as much involved as we can with our observatory. Uh, so please uh, take a look at that because our staff has been working hard to get that done. At the end of today's program, our observatory coordinator, Lauren Zuckerberg, will meet, you, will meet anybody that would like to right outside these doors here, right at the entrance of our observatory to give an observatory tour. Okay. So today's program. It's been two years, seven months, and 21 days since our last observatory slash astronomy lecture. Um, we are very excited to uh, bring back uh, Dr. Michael Ressler. Dr. Ressler is an astronomer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory who has been working with uh, the JWST's mid-infrared instrument since its original concept study in 1997. I was still in high school. He is also a team member and a detect <laughs> detector specialist for the All Sky Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer mission and is now working on the new NASA mission to discover and characterize near Earth asteroids and comets. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mike Ressler. All right, good afternoon. Let me get my little countdown timer started. Otherwise, I will be talking all day, and you probably don't want that. Um, and the other thing is I have to apologize in advance. I caught a cold a couple of weeks ago, and even though the cold is gone, I'm still left with bronchitis. And so if it sounds like I'm trying to cough up my lungs, um, please, <laughs> please pardon the, uh, the rudeness. All right, James Webb Space Telescope. Um, as Aaron mentioned, I started working on it in 1997. I was 33 years old. I'll let you do the math. Um, but what does a project scientist do? Uh, my job 
is, is mostly to guide the engineers as they're building, an in, as they're building the instrument. NASA said, we want an instrument that works at these wavelengths, and MIRI itself was a partnership between the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where I work, and uh, a consortium of European astronomical institutes. And so my job was essentially to say, I'm a scientist, I want to use it. Engineers, here's what it has to be able to do. And it was my signature on the dotted line that told NASA, yes, MIRI will do what it's supposed to do. So kind of an interesting role. I got to uh, meet lots of great people. Uh, got to do lots of experiments on the hardware as we were developing things. Um, but that's, in a nutshell, what a project scientist is supposed to do. Now, had, did anyone hear my talk that I did on Zoom back last November before the launch? Anyone? I see a couple, at least one or two hands. Okay, so this is the updated version. Um, there's, I'll, I'll introduce James Webb a little bit, and then we'll just get right to the pictures, because they're the star of the show. Um, so most people are familiar with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, James Webb has been under development for a long time, obviously, and we finally launched. Um, there are several key differences, and Webb is not a replacement for Hubble. We're not going to yank Hubble out of orbit and only use Webb. We actually hope to use both of them together for a few years. Um, but one of the things is Webb is a lot bigger. Uh, the mirror that collects the light is nearly 21 feet across, whereas Hubble's is only 8 feet across. Um, you'll notice that the Webb's mirrors are gold in color. That's because Webb is designed to work at infrared wavelengths, wavelengths that are longer than your eye can see, because Hubble asked a lot of questions, and we want to use Webb to be able to answer those questions. And to do so, we need to look at longer wavelengths. And I'll say a little bit more about that as we go. Uh, you also notice that Hubble is round, and Webb has that weird hexagonal shape. And I'll explain that as well. OK, so Webb is bigger, but it's not a replacement. It complements it, and it does need to work in the infrared to answer all the questions that Hubble is allowing us to ask. So Webb telescope is a 6-meter diameter telescope, you know, 21 feet across. Uh, if I can use the fancy zoom thing, so if you go from this edge to this edge, that's about 21 feet. Um, there's a person down here kind of for scale, uh, so it is a really big beast. Um, it actually has four instruments that cover 0.7 microns, that's you know the length of the wavelength of light. Your eye can just barely see 0.7. That would be a very deep red color, but almost all the wavelengths that work web at are longer than what your eyes can see. And my instrument, MIRI, works all the way out to 28 microns. Um, web is so big and so expensive, it's actually a partnership between uh, NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. So working together, we built this observatory. And it was launched on an Ariane 5 rocket, and you'll notice that the observatory had to fold up. So we built the world's first origami telescope. Um, so there's, there's no rocket fairing in existence that could hold web unfolded. So everything had to fold up. So the, the wing, the three wing mirrors, there are three on the other side, had to fold in. The secondary mirrors, this uh, little mirror up here that had to flip down and fold up. Um, so all of this had to crunch up to fit into the telescope. And then more importantly, it had to unfold after we launched so that we actually had an observatory. Uh, the other thing to remember is that Webb is now located about a million miles from Earth. Um, the moon is about 250,000 miles. So we're four times farther away from the Earth than the moon is. Uh, the reason is, is that the gravity of the sun and the Earth Working together makes several gravitationally stable spots, reasonably stable. Uh, these are called the Lagrange points, and there are five of them. I won't go into them today. We're at the second Lagrange point, so it's a million miles farther away from the sun than the Earth is. Um, it's a nice place to be. It's, you know, that way we always have the sun and Earth behind us, um, so it's a little easier to, to do our thing. Um, in, that, in that environment, but a million miles from Earth. Okay, there are four instruments on JWST. There are three near-infrared instruments that work from that very red wavelength color, very colors. 
Um, and that was built by the University of Arizona. Uh, NearSpec is one of the European instruments. It's our workhorse spectrograph in the near-infrared. Um, interestingly, in the past, most of our ground-based telescopes, until just a few years ago, if we wanted to take a spectrum, you know, basically break up the light into a rainbow, measure the brightness at every wavelength, which tells us about the composition of the object we're looking at, we could only do one object at a time, which means if you wanted to do many galaxies, it took a long time because you had to go one, 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 one at a time. NearSpec actually has a, a micro shutter array. Think of it, um, you know, the blinds on your windows where you can open and close the shutters to let light in. Um, it has tens of thousands of little shutters, and so we can open specific ones that happen to have a galaxy or a star in that little shutter and we can take spectra of hundreds of galaxies or stars all at the same time. So this lets us be much more efficient when we're trying to say, here's a cluster of galaxies. How far away are they? What are they made of? You know, when did they start forming stars? All the questions that we have, but it allows us to do it very efficiently because it can do more than one at a time. And that was provided by the European Space Agency. Finally, uh, there's the near-infrared I can never remember what it stands for. Near infrared imager and slitless spectrograph uh, that was built by the Canadian Space Agency. It does a little bit of what both the other near infrared instruments do, but it does some very specialized observations. So it co the three together complement each other very well. The limit of those three instruments is that they only go out to five microns wavelength. And so you have the most important instrument, which is MIRI, the mid infrared instrument. And it works from five all the way out to 28 microns. So while there are three instruments to do imaging and spectroscopy in the near infrared, there's one instrument to do all that for the longer wavelengths. And this is a picture of what it looks like. It looks kind of weird, um, but it doesn't have to look pretty. It just has to do its job. Um, so we do imaging. Uh, I'll, I won't explain everything just yet. Okay, near infrared versus infrared, mid infrared. Why do we need four instruments to do all this? Well, different wavelengths of light, different colors of light give us different information about the things that we're looking at. For example, Hubble can see ultraviolet light from galaxies that are nearby. Well, the universe is expanding, so as we look at galaxies farther and farther away, that light is redshifted to longer and longer wavelengths. If you've ever heard an ambulance drive by, you notice that when it's coming toward you, the pitch sounds higher, and as it's going away from you, the pitch is lower. It's called a Doppler shift. Light does exactly the same thing. So as galaxies are going away from us, as they're farther away in the universe and the universe is expanding and pulling them away, the light is redshifted to longer wavelengths. And so what used to be ultraviolet light for Hubble might be redshifted into near infrared wavelengths that, that near cam can see. And if they're really, really far away, they would be redshifted into where MIRI can see. But in general, um, the ultraviolet light from distant galaxies is shifted into the near infrared. Um, MIRI will see visible light from that same galaxy. So near cam will see the ultraviolet, MIRI will see the visible, simply because it gets redshifted into the wavelengths that we can see. Um, in the near infrared, you tend to see more uh, atoms and uh, small molecules um, and things where it's relatively high energy. So we'll see things that are close to stars that are heated up to a thousand degrees or something like that. Each element, each atom has its own spectroscopic signature. It has its own little rainbow, if you will. Um, and so we see mostly atoms. In the mid-infrared, we see molecules. We'll see things like carbon dioxide and methane, and I'll show you one of the spectra toward the end of the talk. Um, in the near-infrared, when we look at stars that are still in the process of forming, you know, stars form in clouds of gas and dust that are opaque to visible light, but we can see them in the infrared. Infrared penetrates that dust. And so in the near-infrared, we tend to see older, more mature stars, Whereas in the mid-infrared, we see, we see the baby stars, the, the, the ones that are just a couple of thousand years old. So if you want to study how stars form in the environment that they form in, you have to do it at mid-infrared wavelengths. Uh, finally, we get, with near-infrared wavelengths, we can see very, very hot planets close to their stars. 
In the mid-infrared, we can see things that look a little bit more like Earth, that have temperatures more like Earth. So together, the, the four instruments do a really good job of addressing a lot of different science topics, but we need all four of them. You can't kick one out and still do the same job. So we work together. Even though the mid-infrared instrument's the most important, um, we, we do work together. So that's, that's a little bit of background. Finally, finally, after many, many years of working on this thing, we launched on Christmas morning, uh, 4.20 a.m. Pacific standard time. Um, actually, it was a lot of fun. I, I didn't go to the launch site. I had no interest in going down to Karoo, French Guiana, where it launched from. But I was at home with my family. We were all in pajamas watching the computer, the live feed from it. So it was, it was actually very nice. Uh, I, I didn't regret that at all. And if you're counting, today is launch plus 283 days. So that was 283 days ago that we launched. Um, of course, there were some comics about a Christmas Day launch. Um, fortunately, we did not take out Santa, although I will admit that I was watching the NORAD Santa Tracker, and Santa did fly over Karoo, French Guiana, a few hours before launch. Um, fortunately, he made it out of the launch zone in time. Anyway, this is what we looked like. And liftoff. Decollage. Decollage, liftoff from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. So that was the European Ariane 5 rocket. Punching is their the heavy through the clouds. 20 seconds into the flight, good pitch program reported. Their auto tracker lost lock. <laughs> Vehicle performance is nominal. That was pretty much it. It, it. it went off into the clouds and we couldn't see it, so it made for a short launch clip. Um, the next clip I want to show you is something that we dumb Americans, at least, didn't know about. So the James Webb Observatory was sitting on top of the second stage booster of the Ariane rocket. And ESA did not tell us that there was a camera at the top of that second booster stage. And so a few minutes after liftoff, um, we got video back from that camera. And if I press, whoops, I blew it. Try again. Oh, come on. Don't do this to me. There we go. Now it's going to work. Um, I hope. There it goes. So this is after the, the telescope observatory separated from that second stage booster, and we got to watch it drift away, you know, sort of our last view of the telescope uh, after launch. And, you know, there's something kind of poignant about it. You know, I worked on this thing so long. It's been, you know, the vast majority of my career. And, uh, you know, watching our baby go off was uh, kind of interesting. So... Uh, over here is the Gulf of Aden and Djibouti and Yemen and Somalia. Um, and Ariane gave us a really good launch. We used very little fuel on the launch. And the trajectory is so good, the solar panels actually started coming out much earlier than we expected. So if you watch right over there, in just a few seconds, you'll see the solar panels start to deploy. How do I get rid of the little hand that's there? Any day now. There we go. So there's the, there are the solar panels starting to deploy. Um, so nobody expected to see that. The, you know, the solar panel said, oh, we're good, let's go. And uh, off they went. So I can watch this video all day. It's, it's just so cool. <laughs> all right, and uh, this was the work of an amateur astronomer, Malcolm Park. And you'll notice the little uh, zip in the center of the field of view. So he just had his telescope out, was taking a picture of the sky where he expected James Webb to be. And so you're seeing James Webb zipping across the sky on its way to our uh, orbital position at the second Lagrange point. So pretty neat stuff. 
And after six months of work showing that everything actually did work, we could declare success. So in the beginning of July, we started our main science observing programs. But before we get to the pictures, a question that people always ask me are, why do the stars in JWST images have six points? So I thought it was worth telling you why. Um, if I have a round telescope so that the, the light gathering mirror is, oh, that's kind of cool, is just a circle, um, the stars end up looking kind of like just a little point. And you'll notice maybe faintly there's some rings around it. And this is a high contrast, uh, larger, you know, to let you see a little bit more. But if your telescope is round, stars look round. You don't see the usual spikes that we're so uh, familiar with seeing. If you put a hole in the center of that telescope, if you look at the telescope out at the observatory, which I encourage you to do, um, light comes in, bounces off a big mirror in the back, off a smaller mirror in the front, and back through a hole in that primary mirror. So like that hole. Um, and you'll notice those rings. Let's see if I can do this. So this ring is a little bit brighter. So it moves some starlight out of the center into the rings around it. And that's just a consequence of physics. Uh, it's diffraction, uh, light, light diffracting around the edges of the telescope. And this is what you're used to seeing because most telescopes hold that secondary mirror using four, we call them spider vanes. Um, and almost all big telescopes are built this way. So if you see pictures from the Palomar 200 inch telescope, you'll see stars that have crosses like the far image over there. Uh, there we go. Um, so this cro these crosses are a consequence of the fact that you're blocking a little bit of the light in the, with these spider veins here. So it's diffracting around those veins and that what, that's what gives the stars four points. And so that's what we're typically used to seeing. However, if you have a hexagon shaped mirror, uh, you get six spikes. Basically you get a spike for each of the edges in this particular picture. And then if you break up the hexagon into 18 hexagonal segments like we use in James Webb, you know, for the most part, stars still look like round stars, except now this little first ring around it is hexagonal shaped. But it looks okay. But if you really zoom in and turn up the contrast, you see these, I don't know what you want to call them, herringbone patterns from the diffraction spikes. Um, but it's still the six-pointed spike, or six-pointed six diffraction spikes. Well, we also have to hold our secondary mirror some way, and instead of using the, the four spider veins, we use three in a peculiar pattern. Um, so get my pointer back here. Uh, so these two um, are symmetric with the mirrors, so they overlap the, the diffraction spikes. But this guy here introduces two new diffraction spikes into our stars. So back over here, so you see the, the main six diffraction spikes, plus there are these two fainter ones here. So when we actually go look at pictures that I didn't invent, you'll notice that star up there looks just like my example. Um, so this is kind of the thumbprint of a JWST image. Every JWST image you will see for the stars that are points of light, you will see the six primary plus the two fainter spikes. And so that's why the images look the way they do. But let's talk about what we're actually looking at. Um, so this is a group of galaxies called Stefan's Quintet. Um, so this was one of the images released on July 12th with our big image release. Um, so the first thing to know is one of these guys doesn't belong. That galaxy just happens to lie in the line of sight. It's actually much closer to us than the other guys. So we'll ignore him. Uh, but these four galaxies are gravitationally interacting with each other. They're kind of colliding. It's, it's a soft collision. And things don't actually hit each other. They kind of pass through each other. But the gravity from each galaxy will pull things around and um, mess up the galaxies, if you will. Um, one of the things, any Lord of the Rings fans in here? Any, anybody watch the movies, the Balrogs? I guarantee you'll never forget this. If you look at, oops, where's my pointer? Those two galaxies, you notice there's a horn here and a horn here. So if you tilt your head a little bit, it looks just like a Balrog from the movie. Um, <laughs> but 
So this is primarily a near-infrared view, but the, there is a little bit of MIRI data in here. So these two galaxies in our little Balrog are, are really shredding each other. And so this, uh, this orangish material is stars and dust that are being stripped out of those galaxies and you know, just being flung out into the universe. Um, they show this orangish-reddish color because all that gas and dust that was in there was being compressed and actually forming a new generation of stars. It's kind of interesting. You destroy a galaxy, you get new stars that maybe form a new galaxy eventually out of it. So that's primarily near-infrared. When we look at it in the mid-infrared, things you still see our Balrog. It's actually a little bit easier to see. But what's going on with that galaxy up there? What's that really, really bright spot? Well, it turns out that galaxy has a huge black hole in the center of it. And you know, if you know your science fiction, at least, you know, when you have a black hole, you get a disk of material that's spiraling into it. That disk of material is getting heated up, and that's what we're seeing with that really bright spot. It's the disk around the black hole, you know, material that's about ready to get sucked in, but it's getting heated up so that we can see it in the mid-infrared without the distraction of all the stars. And so we can see that, that black hole in action as it's gobbling up all the material that's falling into it. So that's the images, the pictures. You know, I also mentioned this spectroscopy thing where we break the light into its component co colors. And there are many reasons that we can, we want to do that. First of all, we can tell that in this, in this galaxy with the black hole in the center, it's got argon, neon, and hydrogen in the material that's swirling around the black hole. Um, these are also color coded so that red Anything that's red is moving away from us. Anything that's blue is moving toward us. And so this is, if, ignore the blue spot up here for a second. These two look like a ring of material where it's, it's spiraling like this. So the upper one is material that's going away from us, and then the ring that's coming back across the bottom is coming toward us. So that's why it's blue. I have no idea why there's a little blue why there's stuff coming toward us up here. So that's something that people who study galaxies are going to have to figure out. Um, we see the same thing over here in molecular hydrogen, that, that ring I mentioned. You know, the, at the top, it's material going away from us. Bottom, it's material coming back toward us. So one can imagine a ring that's spiraling around. It's just the way we happen to be looking at it. So being able to break down the light into its component colors is a way that we can see the composition. We can also see how fast it's moving. And so it's telling us a little bit about what's going on in those galaxies as they're getting shredded. You know, what are the physical processes that are producing what we see? So the spectroscopy is a really important tool. It's, it's not as pretty as the pictures, but it's very important to help us understand what's actually happening. So, um, part of the spectroscopy is we look to see what other elements are there. So this is the spectrum. Um, so the brighter it is, the higher the peak is on this line. But each of these peaks are like a thumbprint for a particular element. So this line that's purple is argon. That emission line, you know, the reason it's bright there, is that's unique to argon. No other element emits that particular color of infrared light, only argon. And so we can use that to say, okay, we've got argon, we've got neon, we've got sulfur. Uh, oh, there's some oxygen out there. So you know it's it's got a lot you know it's got all the usual usual atomic elements, but we also see some molecules, uh, just hydrogen, two hydrogen atoms together. That's that's hydrogen gas. Um, there's also, whoops, there we go, silicates. Silicates are basically dirt and rocks. In fact, I was going to save this to the end, but in fact, if you go that way, there's a really excellent mineral collection here in the library. And a number of those rocks are silicates. Quartz, uh, I think Labradorite qualifies as a silicate, and maybe even jade, although jade's kind of messy. Um, but this is the same stuff that we have here on Earth. It's just silicate minerals. Um, so these spectra are giving us some information about what's going on around this black hole just by the, the type of light that it's emitting. So there's really a lot, a lot of information here. So yeah, they're pretty, the pictures are pretty, but we can understand so much more by doing that spectroscopy, breaking down the light to really tease out what's in there. 
Okay, uh, the next object, this is actually a Hubble Space Telescope image of a cluster of galaxies with the very unlovely name of SMAX 0723. Um, astronomers are not very creative in our naming. Um, but the important thing on this one, oops, where's my pointer? You'll notice that some of these galaxies are curved and you can kind of follow them in arcs that are centered around this cluster of galaxies in the center. So the, the curved galaxies are galaxies that lie very far away and the, the galaxies in the center are closer to us. And as light comes from those distant galaxies, the gravity of the nearby galaxies actually acts like a magnifying glass and distorts the light and focuses it a little bit, makes it brighter than it would be otherwise. And so um, by analyzing the shape of the galaxies, we learn something about you know, how far away they are, how massive they are, what they looked like a very long time ago. And so these so-called gravitational lenses are a good tool for us to understand how galaxies formed in the early universe. But that image is all kind of orange. It's not very interesting by itself, so we looked at it with Webb. And now colors explode into view because going out into the infrared lets us distinguish different things much more finely than we could do with Hubble. Um, not that Hubble is a bad instrument, it's just looking at different things. We have a different view in the, in the infrared, and so that's why the color comes alive, because it allows us to, to discriminate things a little better. So the orange galaxies in this picture are all the ones that are very farthest away. The white ones that don't have the six spikes are nearby galaxies, and then anything that has the spikes, those are just stars in our own galaxy that happen to lie in the way. Um, of course, I think the picture looks better in the mid-infrared with Miri. That's, that's us on the uh, left-hand side, um, the, the near-infrared image for comparison. And there's something I learned really early on with Miri images of galaxies. Galaxies are made out of Skittles. <laughs> you know, the, the, the little candies that are red and orange and purple and green and all that. Tell me I'm wrong. These look like Skittles. Um, <laughs> So, and, and I, this, this, these were very late images. This, these are from the, almost the first set of images that we took on the sky with Miri. And even here you see, you know, the multiple colored galaxies. So what we think is happening is there's, there's a kind of uh, dust made of, a, made of organic minerals that kind of fluoresces very brightly at seven microns. Well, I mentioned redshift redshifts, the farther away the galaxy is, that light is going to be moved of that emission. The important point of this is every time we look at the universe with a new set of eyes, with new techniques, we see stuff that we never expected. And that's what makes this so much fun. It's not just taking pictures of the, the old favorites, the things we know and love. It's the things we didn't even know to look for or you know, ways of looking at it that we didn't expect. Um, so you know, we had a lot of fun with this. Um, the other thing this image does, you know, I mentioned some galaxies are much farther away, the ones that are orangish are much farther away. Well, again, by looking at spectra, we can determine how far away the galaxy is based on how the universe is expanding. So this galaxy up at the top, we see hydrogen, oxygen, and there's another hydrogen line. Um, and so we, you know, because of where those emission lines line up, we can say, okay, that one's 13 or 11.3 billion light years away. But this next guy down, we see those same emission lines, but they're at much longer wavelengths, which means it's farther away. And so light left from this galaxy 12.6 billion years ago. This guy, they're even farther, farther into the red, so we don't even see that hydrogen line anymore. We only see these two guys. And so that's 13 billion light years away. And then finally, this, this one's at the limit of what the near-spec instrument can do. So it's about 13.1 billion light years away. So by looking at lines that we know where they are and see how far they moved, that's how we can figure out how far something away is. And so these are already farther away than anything Hubble can see. So just one of our first images with Webb allows us to see things closer back to the Big Bang than we've ever been able to see before. And one more thing about this guy. So I'm going to shove it over here. 
It's hard to see, but, oh, wait, I can do a magnifier. Maybe. Yes. Look at that galaxy right there. It has freckles or spots or something. Um, let's, let's blow that guy up a little bit. Um, these are satellite galaxies around that one galaxy. And this is causing astronomers who study galaxies early in the universe some headaches because we didn't expect those to be there yet. Um, this means that these, they're, they're just kind of spherical clumps of stars. We call them globular clusters. Um, you know, we know they formed a long time ago, but nobody expected them to be that distinct, that mature so early. So our models of how galaxies form and how they form these globular clusters to go with them isn't quite as good as we thought it was. And so, you know, astronomers are going to have fun for a lot of years trying to figure out why that image looks the way it does, why, why that galaxy looks so speckly. And it's actually not the only one. There, there are other galaxies in here that show the same thing. So this isn't rare, um, but our current models said it should be rare. So that's, that's what we need to figure out next. Um, so again, anytime you have a new tool, you find things that you never even thought to look for um, because it's a new way of looking. Okay, so a few other things that were re released back in July. Um, uh, one, of, one of the most one of the hottest fields in astronomy right now is looking for planets around other stars. You know, so we know the ones around our own star. But what about other stars? Can we see planets? Well, one of the techniques we can use to find them is to watch for a, a planet to cross directly in front of the star and measure the light output of the star as it's doing that because as it's transiting, as it's you know, going across the star, we notice a small dip in starlight. So, whoops, I don't need the magnifier anymore. Let's try this again. So, you know, this is, you know, at 100, 100% is when the planet is not in front of the star, but when it crosses, it drops a little bit. In this particular case, the total amount of starlight dropped by almost a percent, which means it's actually a really big planet. Um, but what's interesting is we can get a spectrum of the star and planet when they're not blocking each other, and another spectrum when they are, and subtract the two, and that actually gives us a spectrum of the planet itself. And so in this particular uh, spectrum, we can see that there's a lot of water vapor, um, you know, good old H2O, in the atmosphere of this planet. Why do we care? Well, water is one of the fundamental building blocks of life. Um, if we want to eventually try to answer the question, is, the li is there life out in the universe, we want to know that the building blocks are common. And in fact, we see them all over the place. And uh, one of my later, later pictures, we'll see what other interesting molecules are available. So this, this was a, a really good result. We showed early on that, yes, we actually can detect water in the atmospheres of other planets. OK, this is a Hubble picture of the uh, Southern Ring Nebula. Um, because it kind of looks like a ring, has a, has a bright star in the center. When stars die, the, the star itself begins to collapse, and then it blows off the outer layers of the star. So imagine an onion or something, I guess, where you blow off the outer layers. That's, that's what creates these rings. What, that's what the, creates these rings around the star. This used to be on the surface of the star. It all got blown off. Uh, and it makes these very pretty things. Uh, so this is Hubble's view. Um, here's what it looked like to near spec. Um, it's just fantastic because you see all that structure that you couldn't see in the Hubble view, all those little knots and clumps and turbulence. Um, when a star blows up, it's a very messy thing. Um, it's not like it just goes puff. You know, it, it truly, truly kind of explodes and really makes a mess. And then, of course, the Miri version is interesting. Now, the, the interesting thing about Miri is you see two stars very clearly in the center, and it's actually this red one, which is the one that blew up. Uh, it's, it's not the brighter one. And more interestingly, some colleagues of mine who are working on this found that there's a, a, a small disk of material around that star. So when it blew up, it, it still managed to keep material around it, kind of like you know, sort of like the asteroid belt, maybe, a little bit in our own solar system, 
just dust and rock and stuff that's still orbiting right around the star despite the fact that it blew up. Um, and so, you know, it tells us a little bit about this process that stars go through uh, as they're dying. Okay, so this is the one that I think ended up on the brochure. Um, so this is a star-forming region called the Carina Nebula. Um, there are some very hot stars out of the field of view that emit an awful lot of ultraviolet light. That ultraviolet light is actually impacting this cloud of gas and dust and essentially destroys the dust at the edge, and that's what gives us this kind of really sharp, sharp edge, is that ultraviolet light is so intense it's ripping things up. Um, did you ever see a street sign that's been in the sun too long, it fades and all that? It's the same process. It's ripping up the paint on the sign. The same thing's going on here. Um, in the infrared, we see all sorts of interesting things. So there's a very young star right there um, that's shooting out jets of material as it's forming. There's sort of swirls in the dust um, from you know, gravity working against the starlight that's hitting it. Uh, just you know, all sorts of neat things going on. Um, there's the Hubble version. It's cool, but I like the infrared better. More importantly, this is the MIRI version. MIRI actually lets us see deeper into that dust. So um, there's a cluster of stars over here that we can just see at the longer wavelengths. Um, here's our other little guy that's shooting out jets of material. Um, there's just all sorts of neat things in here. And I guarantee you some graduate student somewhere is going to be writing his PhD dissertation just on this object because there's so much stuff going on in here. And then there's much more to come. So the images before were all, th all things that were released on July 12th when we did our first big image reveal. Um, but of course, we're doing science now. Uh, we're, we're doing lots of new observations. So here's one called the Cartwheel Galaxy. Um, I hope it's relatively obvious why it's called that. You know, it looks kind of like a cartwheel. This is. This used to be a normal galaxy, um, probably a, a spiral galaxy, where another galaxy was very rude and just shot straight through it. And when it did that, it's, it causes sort of like ripples on a lake when you, when you toss a rock into it. Um, the gravity of that galaxy passing through it just kind of sent ripples and started shredding the target galaxy so that what used to be, um, what used to be the arms are now this ring there's still sort of the center part of the galaxy that's still intact, but the thing is, is just you know, expanding and, and kind of losing itself. Um, but again, in the mid-infrared, you'll notice there's a bunch of bright spots. All this is very bright along here. As a result of the galaxy of that, a result of the gravity of that passing galaxy, it's compressed the dust that was in the galaxy and it's forming a new generation of stars. So, you know, even in catastrophe, you form new stars and things, things go on. Um, so the two views together give us a lot of information about what, what happened and, and how things are going to behave in the future. Um, one, one particular observing mode that I didn't mention is something called coronography. It's a, it's a technique where we can block the light of the central star and look to see if there's anything close to the star around it. If we want to look for planets around another star, the problem is the star can be a billion times brighter than the planet. So we have to have some way of making the star look faint so we have some hope of seeing the planet around it. And that's exactly what happened here. Um, between NIRCAM and MIRI, we actually did detect the planet around this star. Um, Again, astronomers have really dull names, HIP65426, uh, just a plain old normal looking star. But if we block out the starlight, the star is at these little symbols, star symbols, uh, we actually see a planet that's in orbit around it. So there's some artifacts here, it's only one planet, not three. Uh, but the fact is we can directly take an image of a planet around another star. You know, I mentioned we were able to do a planet or a transit, sorry, where we watch the planet block the starlight. That's one way to detect them. The other way is just take pictures of them directly. Um, so JWST is, is very good at being able to do this sort of coronography. And these are a couple of my favorites. Everybody knows that Saturn has rings, right? 
It was actually seeing Saturn in a small telescope when I was in sixth grade that got me interested in astronomy. Well, it turns out all four of the big planets in our solar system have rings, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Um, so this is, this is a special near-infrared image of Jupiter. Uh, there's the great red spot, but you can see it has this very faint ring around it. And this one is my really favorite on the right side. That's Neptune. Um, when I was an undergraduate student, I worked for Jim Elliott and Ted Dunham, who discovered the rings around the planet Uranus. And we were working very hard to find rings around Neptune. We thought there ought to be some, but we, we had a devil of a time trying to, to see anything. We certainly couldn't take images like this, and the techniques we were using kind of hinted that maybe there were some rings there, but not really. Then, of course, Webb does a two-second exposure, and pff, <laughs> there it is. Um, so pretty neat. There, there are two little moons, one there and one there. These are known as shepherd moons. The gravity from this little moon is actually what makes, you know, what drags the material into the ring shapes. So uh, the fact that we've got two nice rings there is a result of having those two moons sweep up that material. Um, so anyway, and, and then there are clouds on, in the atmosphere of Neptune. I just think that one's fantastic. Um, I'm not a planetary scientist, but I still think it's fantastic. Um, and then finally, um, I wanted to mention the spectroscopy. If you caught my talk nearly a year ago, uh, you, you saw this spectrum of a very young star that's in the process of forming. And I made a really lame joke about the fact that we detected methane gas, which means there are cows in space. But um, no, there are not cows in space. But anyway, um, here's a spectrum that was taken with MIRI. It's not the same object, unfortunately, but it's similar. It's also a very young star that's still in, in the process of forming. And so the Spitzer Space Telescope was an infrared space telescope that flew from 2003. Um, its prime mission was 2003 to 2009. And so you know, it detected a bunch of interesting things. It's water ice and methyl alcohol, methane, silicates are good old rocks again. Uh, more water ice, that's carbon dioxide. Unfortunately, I covered up the label. Um, but they're interesting because they are some of the basic building blocks of life. These are all things that go along with life on Earth. So the potential is out there. With MIRI, we see all the same things, except now we see even more. And I can't remember what all the chemical names are. Um, but here's, here's our methyl alcohol, methyl um, methanol. Um, there's our methane again. Uh, here's some ammonia. Uh, oh, boy. That's, that's still the methanol, yes. Do we have some chemists in the room? You can help me out here. Uh, I know there's formic acid, formaldehyde, uh, ethanol. Uh, I think I'm forgetting one or two. But there's a whole bunch of more complex molecules that we now have the sensitivity and spectral resolution to actually see. So the fact that we're seeing stuff like formaldehyde, you know, you generally only think of formaldehyde as the stuff that you put your dead critters in when you're doing biology in high school. Um, but, but these are all molecules that are important to the chain of life some way or another. Um, so JWST, the Webb Telescope, is going to give us a, a really... It's going to give us a really good... That was my timer, not my phone ringing. Um, <laughs> I silenced my phone. Um, but, but so Webb will give us a really, really powerful tool to study what molecules are available as we form a star because we'd like to know how our own solar system was assembled. Where did life come from? Um, how common might life be? So far, we can say, well, the building blocks are really common. Webb can't prove whether there's life somewhere else or not. But it will at least say, yeah, we see the basic building blocks in all these different environments. So the stuff we need for life is common. And that's an interesting lead into the next mission. Um, you know, presumably, someday, we'll build, we'll build things that are specifically trying to determine whether there's life or not. So anyway, I think the spectrum is fantastic just because of all the interesting stuff that we see in it. So here's some websites uh, where you can download all this stuff, uh, read all the right answers of the things that I got wrong. Um, so the first images is where you'll see the first five. There's a, a, a blog. Uh, where'd it go? 
well, anyway, nasa.gov slash web. Um, the European Space Agency has theirs. The Space Telescope Science Institute is the organization that's actually running the telescope now that it's up and operating. So they're responsible for the day-to-day -day operations, and so they, they have some of their own things. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, I'd be happy to hang around for a bit and answer questions. I think we have an official question and answer time. Um, so I, I do invite you to go, actually, let me go back. I do invite you to check out the websites because there's a lot of, lot of stuff that I couldn't go in today and new things will be coming out. I know there's another image release coming tomorrow and next week, um, one, of the project, one of the science projects that I'm involved in is gonna release a picture of a star that looks very, very weird. So stay tuned, um, <laughs> go, go check it out. Okay, questions. Do we have any questions? Right, right up here. Just, here you go. In one, of your, in one of your spectra, you showed some small molecules like hydrogen and water, and you had iron. Yes. But no other first transition metals, no, no zinc, cobalt, chromium, whatever. How, how come it's only iron? So iron is very, very common. Um, so zinc and things like that are really trace elements. So even in the sun, there's not very much of true metal. You know, to an astronomer, metal is anything heavier than helium. But I mean, real metals like zinc and molybdenum and praseodymium and all those things you know, are things that are at the parts per billion or parts per trillion level. So their signatures are just too weak for us to, to pick up. Um, iron's a little bit unique. There, there is a lot tends to be a lot of it. Um, it. It also has some particularly strong emission lines, so that one's easier to pick up, but the, the rest of them, there's just not enough there. Okay. Yeah, hi. Um, we've all heard that the um, un uh, light is the fastest thing in the universe, and I, I just recently heard that the universe is actually expanding faster than light, and I'm wondering if you've heard that, and how could James Webb help with that? So not expanding faster than light. Um, however, because, because of special relativity, you can't just say, well, it's, it took light this long to travel, thus it's this many billions of light years physically away from us. The, the expanding universe distorts distances, if you will. So... I'm, you know, I, so I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to, but you know, the, the speed of light is the ultimate speed limit. But things get weird when you start moving nearly that fast, and so that may be some of, of what they're after. Thank you. My question was if we could watch in high speed and look at Andromeda colliding into the Milky Way, what would happen to individual solar systems like ours? Would we even know it if we were on this planet while all that activity was happening? Yeah, generally not. Um, so, you know, galaxies are gravitational groups of stars, but the distances between stars are so vast that when two galaxies collide, you know, they may feel some gravitational influence um, from that, but they don't actually hit each other. So. For the most part, when, when our Milky Way eventually collides with the Andromeda Galaxy, we probably won't, you know, well, whatever's on Earth at that point, we won't know. That's, that's still a long time in the future. Got other things to worry about. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we, we won't particularly notice just because the distances between the stars is so great. Okay, uh, a couple up here. Hi, thank you, Doctor. For those of us who can't even wrap our minds around the idea of the you know, unlimited universe, could you c explain a little bit more about the light years? Because we're apparently we're seeing light that's either from, in the, from the web from between 11 point something to 13.1 billion years old. What exactly does that mean? Because if we're seeing what left those areas um, that long ago, how do we know that there's even anything there now? You know? That's, so, that's actually, <laughs> no, that's, that's an outstanding point. So. When I say, you know, we're looking at this galaxy 13.1 billion light years away, that does mean that light left that galaxy 13.1 billion years ago. So that's what it looked like back then. 
we have no idea what it looks like now. We can make some guesses because we have models of how a galaxy will change over time. And so we know what galaxies near us look like, you know, that are, you know, we're seeing light only a couple of million years ago instead of billions of years ago. And so, you know, we see galaxies, you know, at various distances so we can say, okay, so this galaxy might be similar to that when it looks like this now, it looked like that then, so we can kind of connect the dots for how they change over time. But you're absolutely right, those galaxies are what they looked like 13 billion years ago. They do not look like that now. They may have gone coll undergone collisions with other galaxies, so they may not even exist anymore. Um, but that's, that's the interesting thing about the finite speed of light. It takes time for light to get to us, and so, you know, you'll hear people talk about Webb being a time machine because, it, you know, it allows us to look back in time because it takes light that long to get here. So, yeah, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right on. You understand physics. <laughs> yeah, well, that's an interesting question, too. Um, okay, a couple questions up here. Hi. Could you tell us a little bit about your... Project Neo Surveyor. Okay, um, so believe it or not, Congress actually passed an act back in 2005, the George E. Brown Act, that said, go find all asteroids that might someday get close to Earth that are larger than 140 meters in diameter. Why 140 meter, 140 meters? an asteroid that big that hit Earth would wipe out Southern California. So it would do, you know, really big regional damage. And so to try to follow that law, um, we want to build a mission that will, will survey the sky and look for, look for these objects. Unfortunately, in typical congressional fashion, they did not appropriate any money to actually do that <laughs> in 2005. Um, so we're still struggling, you know, trying to get all our funding in order. Um, but we are starting to work on it. Uh, we're now actually past what we call our preliminary design review phase. So we've designed the mission. Um, we've had it checked by independent experts to make sure that we're not doing anything stupid. Um, but we are trying to actually build a mission specifically to look for those asteroids. So we'll, we'll survey big swaths of the sky, uh, just looking for anything that might come close. Um, so when we do the survey, we'll see an asteroid moving across the frame that will allow us to determine an orbit. From that orbit, we can say, is it ever gonna come close to Earth? And for the ones that do, oh, let's keep track of those guys, keep an eye on them. So it's, it's still very much in development. We hope to launch in about 2027, um, but it's, it's an interesting question because, if you recall, in 2013, there was an asteroid about the size of a school bus that um, blasted the air above Chelyabinsk in Russia, um, and it blew out windows over hundreds of miles, caused, there were about 1,200 injuries, if I remember right, mostly from flying glass. Um, thankfully, that mostly exploded in the atmosphere, so it didn't actually hit the ground. Um, but, you know, these things are out there, and we decided, well, we have the technology, let's go find the ones that are actually potentially causing trouble and see if we can do anything about them. If you heard about the DART mission uh, that collided with a asteroid moon, if you will, uh, on the 26th, that was one of the techniques that we might be able to use to move an asteroid just enough so that it misses the Earth instead of hitting the Earth. And so the DART mission was actually a test to see if that was feasible. So Neo Surveyor will hopefully find them. Things like DART will hopefully move them. And you know, we can say, hey, we're defending the planet a little bit. Now, we don't have any reason to believe that there's anything with our name on it just yet. But you know, for the first time, we actually can ask, answer the question, you know, what's out there? And so um, I was asked to be project scientist on that one. Same kind of role, make sure the engineers are building something that will do the science. And um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. So, so I think that's just about our official time. So uh, join me in thanking Dr. Ressler. <laughs> right. And I'll hang, I'll hang out a little bit longer if people have questions. Um,
But um, thanks for coming. Appreciate you being here. Thank you.